Hey folks, what you're about to watch is a microphone test that started off as this tiny little project that turned into something a whole lot bigger. Basically, this started because I was looking for a new microphone. I shoot with the Lumix GH4 and I wanted a mic to have on there that would be relatively small, low profile, lightweight, but obviously be very good quality. And I own a Rode mic, a Video Mic Pro that I've had for many years, and that's been a great mic, but it's a little big, and I thought maybe I could get something a little bit smaller. So I started off when I sent an email to B&H asking for some recommendations for alternatives to the mic that I already had. They sent back a couple of recommendations, and I added another one into that and ended up requesting all three of these for comparison. I have a relationship with B&H where they'll send me pretty much whatever I'd like so I can do reviews and talk about them on the air. Um, and then, of course, in exchange, I put an affiliate link. So if you do decide to buy any microphones as a result of this video that you're about to watch, please do use the affiliate links in the description here because that's what pays for these videos. Anyway, so I got these three mics, and the three mics that I had are the Shure VP83, the Senol SCS98, and the Rode Stereo Video Mic Pro. Now, for this test, we also wanted to compare to the Rode Video Mic Pro, which was the mic that I already had. Plus, we also did a test with comparison with, you know, only because I already had it, this tiny little thing, the Rode Video Micro. And then just to round it all out, we wanted to include no mic at all, just the built-in microphone on the camera. Now, the way that we ran this test was fairly scientific and straightforward. We got three cameras, three GH4, so that we had exactly the same cameras, the same internal audio processing and all that. And then we rigged them up onto a bar where all three cameras are side by side. And we ran two rounds of tests, so one with one round of the three mics and then the other three mics. We did test both interior and exterior and on a location, kind of a normal average location. The interior test we ran at a variety of distances, three, five, and nine feet from the camera. And the outdoor one was, I think, five and nine feet of the camera, something like that. And then the final one is the interior is more like a, it's in a cafe. It's kind of a normal average where you might use this type of mic scene. Now, the way we've edited this together, it's not in the order necessarily we shot it, but we've put all the mics back to back so that you can hear as clearly as possible the difference between each one. Hopefully, we've done a good job of setting it up to make it easy to compare. Now, if you scroll down in the show notes here, you'll see that there are individual tests listed with time code next to them. If you click on that time code, it's going to jump you around to that part of the show. So if you're interested in a specific microphone or a specific test, you should be able to jump around fairly easily. Hopefully, we've put this whole thing together to make it easy to understand and easy to come to your own conclusions. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the conclusion is. I want you to come to your own conclusion and put it in the comments. You know, in some cases, it's going to be a little bit more obvious than others. Some are quite close. Some are really far apart. Uh, but that's going to be up to you guys to decide. I'm just putting this out there for everyone to have a listen to and see what you think and come up with your own conclusions. So let's start by taking a look at me putting together the rig to do these tests. I almost forgot. If you want to see the original video where this whole thing started with the original unboxing of the three primary mics that came in from B&H, click right here. This is the video that you want to see. Thanks. So we've got the metal bar here. We're going to drill some holes in this thing. I just need to measure where we're going to put it. The whole idea is that this camera plate, tripod plate, is going to go into the middle of the bar. We're going to get the pretty close to the exact center position. It's not like it has to be super exact. And then measure out where we're going to put these cameras. The nice thing about this bar is this is one thick heavy duty bar, which means even if I drill holes quite close to each other, it's going to be totally solid, strong enough for what we're doing here. So let's just start measuring. Now, these don't have to be super precise, but that's good enough for that. I think that's pretty good. So there we go. We got our marks. Let's go drill some holes. All right, so let's get this thing mounted onto the tripod plate. Cool. All right, so now I've got my mounting plate. Perfect, so now I can mount up cameras on here. Sweet. Now that's pretty stinking cool. Right on. And then we'll just mount up a mic on each one of these. And our test case will look something like that. Oh, this is cool. All right, so there we go. That's how our test is going to be set up. I think that is pretty awesome. There are considerable differences between the levels that are being output from the microphones as it, before we even get started on any recording. So 
I've got a machine generating white noise. It's just a laptop playing. Simplynoise.com. Simply Very good website for generating white noise. And uh, trying to get even levels across all three microphones. Now, traditionally on a GH4, the kind of the standard de facto, this is the way you set it up, is you set your internal, uh, you set your mic recording levels at minus 12 and then do all of your adjusting on the microphone itself. And what I wanted to do, was I expected to do, is have each mic set at its default zero position. So pretty much every mic is gonna have a zero dB position and then a minus and a plus. Like this one's got minus 10 and plus 20. This one's also minus 10 plus 20. This one, the Senol, is minus 10 and plus 10. So it has a 10, less 10 dB available gain in hardware. Okay. But when I turned all these on, set them all to zero, and set the internal recording to minus 12, the only one that was picking up any levels on the auto level meter was the Shure mic. So go ahead and hit, go ahead and hit that level, that uh, white noise again. So this is the Shure microphone, and you can see here that it's at minus 12, it's at zero on the hardware, and if I'm silent, we get four bars of empty, five bars full. So that is, I'm gonna call that a good level. That's where I wanna be. Now I look at the Rode stereo mic, it's at zero. If I take it all the way down to minus 12, you can see I'm barely registering anything at all there. That can't possibly be good. So I'm gonna start by bringing up the hardware. Let's bring this up to plus 20. And now, if anything, we're a little bit over. And when I'm saying a little bit over, it, it might be perfectly fine. We're not peaking until we get into that second one. But the, frankly, this audio that he's playing there is not that loud. I think when we're talking, it's going to be louder than that. So to me, this is overdriven. So I'm going to back this down to zero and then bring it up in software. And plus six is about right, maybe a little too high. Okay, so we're at plus four. So we're gonna call plus four with the Rode hardware set to zero to be even with the Shure at zero and the software at minus 12. And then there's the Senol mic. On the Senol, we've got the microphone set to zero on the hardware. We've got nothing on the screen. If I bring this all the way up to plus six, we're kind of almost getting there. If I go to plus 10 on the mic, if anything, we're a little bit high. So let's back it down a little bit. I'm gonna call it there. All right, so let's have a quick recap of our settings on all cameras. The Rode Stereo Video Mic Pro is set to plus four internally, zero on the hardware. The Shure is set to minus 12 internally, zero on the hardware. And the Senol Mic is set to plus 10 on the hardware and plus two on the internal camera setting. So we're gonna see what kind of a difference that gives us. Uh, we may end up having to redo the entire first test if the levels are just completely wildly all over the place, but we are at this point ready to start recording. So our first recording is going to be a close to camera, about five foot away. We are going to have a conversation. Sean's gonna join me on camera. We're gonna grab a couple of books and read passages out of the book so that we have a consistent same thing to read every take uh, so that we have uh, hopefully a little bit of consistency across this crazy test. So let's move to the other side of the camera. So we are just going to read passages to each other. Okay. All right. I'll, I uh, I picked a passage from your book, your li lovely library over there, uh, Flying Through the Clouds, Surf Photography from Jim Rusi. And I have chosen The History of Photography by Beaumont Newhall. Interesting. <sighs> Sorry, just the title. Wow. Just the title. Wow. You see what this is like? All right. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends who were doing exciting things in the field of surf photography. Interesting. Okay, my turn. In the, Dege, De, in the Degays of the Daguerreotype, in the days of the Daguerreotype, the Calotype, and the Collodion Plate, photographers made exposures simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends who were doing exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, photographers made exposures simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends who were doing exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, photographers made exposures simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. Uh, still reading from this amazing book. Uh, that's it's the same paragraph. That's so oh, it's the same paragraph. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let me go back to the... Uh, maybe I'll read it better this time. Where is it? It's in the beginning here somewhere. Some beautiful pictures in here. 
<laughs> so cuts. Here we go. And when I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends who were doing exciting things in the field of surf photography. Meanwhile, back in 1801, <laughs> in the days of the daguerreotype, not the days of the daguerreotype, but the days of the daguerreotype. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype and the collodion plate, photographers made exposures simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends who were doing exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype and the collodion plate, photographers made exposures simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends who were doing exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, photographers made exposures simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. Wow, wow, wow. Great. Nine feet. That's a, I, OK, so now uh, we've just recorded a five foot and a five and a nine foot test. Uh, I did not adjust the mic sensitivity for the nine foot test, so I'm expecting to be a little bit quieter than the five foot. But that's fair, because when you're out and about, you're not going to be constantly messing with your camera. You want just a basic, like, set it, and that's it. With that in mind, if I was being really fair, I probably would have uh, left the software the same and only adjusted the hardware. But I'm not that clever, so that's not what I did. Um, what I would, did just do was had our same white noise generator happening at 13 feet away and have adjusted the cameras and microphones to get as close to a consistent level again as we could. So where I have ended up is with the Rode at plus 20 in the hardware and the software at minus four. On the Shure, I am also at plus 20 on the hardware and still at minus 12 on the mic level adjustment, on the software. Now that brings us to the Senol, which we are not sure if we're gonna be able to hear at all at this distance. The Senol is still at plus 10, because of course that's where it was to begin with. So the zero and minus 10 are virtually useless at this point. And I've brought the software all the way up to plus six. This can't possibly be good. I am really concerned that we're gonna get very not good audio out of this. And even at that setting, the mic inputs were still lower than the other two mics. And again, we have maxed this out. So with the Senol, this is the most we're going to get. Don't have high hopes, but of course, we'll find out once we actually listen to it. Who knows, maybe I'm completely wrong, and it's going to sound amazing. So are we ready to go do some more reading? Yeah. Let's go read. I saved my spot. You saved your spot? Excellent. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends who were doing exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, Photographers made exposures simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends who were doing exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, photographers made exposures simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends who were doing exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, photographers made exposures simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. We're live, right? And now. we're live. Okay, so yeah. let's just take a quick little break out of this. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment. Nothing like a uh, live stream in the middle of a recorded stream. And uh, I just want to update you quickly on the test that we're doing. So yesterday we tested three of the microphones, the, the three that are actually our test mics uh, here in the studio. We kind of ran out of time to finish our test yesterday, so we're back here a second day to record the other mic. So that's the original Video Mic Pro and then the Mini Rode, as well as no on-camera mic at all. One thing that I want to point out, one of the test mics is the Senol mic. And when you see the final recordings on this, you're going to see a little bit of frustration in this microphone. And one of the big frustrations, which we now looked up this morning and found out <laughs> it's a feature, is the on-off switch on here. When you slip, flip it to on, the little LED flashes, but that's it. It doesn't stay on. So you don't actually know if the mic is on or not. You also don't actually know if the battery is dying or not. The other mics, when you turn them on, they get a little light that pops on and stays on, except this mic doesn't have a battery in it, so we'll need to do that. Here we go, that one. So that's on, that's green. That's a good thing. We want to know that. And when it goes low, it goes red. That's a good thing. I don't know why. And somebody in a comment somewhere said that that is not on to save battery life. How grateful of them. <laughs> Thank you so laughing. much. OK, so 0 dB on this camera with the microphone set at it. 0 is giving us the even tone level that we want. That's good. OK, now to set the internal only. OK, I'm going to call that plus 2 on here is even. And now this mic, minus 4. 
Okay, you can kill that. All right, so again, what we've just done, we had a white noise generator going. We have now set these three cameras to be relatively even, as even as we could, and um, uh, th which was four bars open because we want reasonable <clears throat> levels when talking. Say something for me to a good pitch. Um, I can't wait to read this passage from the book. It's so exciting. Well, actually, yours is way more okay, exciting so than mine. That's, so that's it. So these are all set even and ready to go. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some friends who were doing an exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, photographers made exposure simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some friends who were doing an exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, photographers made exposure simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some friends who were doing an exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, photographers made exposure simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. At least it wasn't out of focus. <laughs> oh, shit. I've never... <laughs> All right, here we go. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends doing some exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, Photographers made exposure simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends doing some exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, photographers made exposure simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. When I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends doing some exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, Photographers made exposure simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds or even minutes later. Okay, cut that. So now we're ready to do the 13 foot test on the second bank of mics. So I have just readjusted the, uh, the input levels. So for the Rode VideoMic Pro, we are set at plus 20 on the hardware and minus 12 on the software. If I set the camera or the microphone at zero and took the software all the way up to plus six, it was almost in the right spot, but not quite. So in general, I think the hardware is better. So we did plus 20 on the hardware, minus 12 on the software, and we've got even levels. On the GH4 without a microphone, we have cranked it all the way up to plus six. It is uh, possibly a little bit under, but clearly we're gonna be picking up a lot more room tone with that mic. And then the Rode mini microphone, we are at zero on here. So remember this microphone does not have a hardware gain control on it. So it's just whatever we get in software and zero on here is picking it up at about the same level. So that's that, let's do this test. Uh, when I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends doing exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype and the collodion plate, photographers made exposure simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds, even minutes later. Uh, when I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends doing exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, photographers made exposure simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds, even minutes later. Uh, when I first came out of Hawaii, I found some new friends doing exciting things in the field of surf photography. In the days of the daguerreotype, the calotype, and the collodion plate, photographers made exposure simply by removing the lens cap and replacing it seconds, even minutes later. We don't have the white noise generator today, um, so I've got Ryan talking instead, and I'm watching the levels here, trying to get them as even as possible. I think we got there. So let's see, what we have is on the Rode Stereo Mic Pro, we're at plus 20 on the hardware and minus 12 on the software. Um, if I go zero on the hardware, I have to take the software pretty high up, and we definitely don't wanna, we're trying to keep the software as low as possible, just because that is the general wisdom with this camera. So that is set there. And then on the Sure, we have the hardware also set at, well, hardware's still at zero actually, isn't it? Yep, hardware's still at zero. And I've got the software up to minus nine. Yeah, minus nine on the software, zero on the hardware. If I go to plus 20 on the hardware, I can't get the software low enough without peaking. So that's good. And then over here, we've got the Senol and the Senol is at plus 10 because at zero, I'm getting almost nothing. So same experience we had before. We already got to crank up the hardware and the software is brought all the way up to plus one. So we have a little bit more room to grow, but not much at all. Uh, let's just take a look at some ambient tone and see if I can get, if make sure they're all even when nobody's talking. Pretty good. 
I think it's pretty good, so I think we're ready to go. Okay. Black bear occasionally strip the bark of some of these species and use the exposed sapwood as a food source. Some wildlife feeds on the seeds of these trees and use smaller trees for cover. This is Rolling Stone. Uh, Sean T. Collins wrote this article, Why Rogue One is a better Star Wars film than Force Awakens. Bitch, I seriously beg to differ. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Never mind the subtitle. From literally its first seconds, which ditches the Pavlonian jolt of the series opening crawl and John Williams' unmistakable fanfare blast. Okay. Black bear occasionally strip the bark of some of these species and use the exposed sapwood as a food source. Some wildlife feeds on the seeds of these trees and use smaller trees for cover. Never mind the subtitle. From literally its first seconds, which ditches the Pavlonian jolt of the series opening crawl and John Williams' unmistakable fanfare blast. Okay. Black bear occasionally strip the bark of some of these species and use the exposed sapwood as a food source. Some wildlife feeds on the seeds of these trees and use smaller trees for cover. Never mind the subtitle, from literally its first seconds, which ditches the Pavlonian jolt of the series opening crawl and John Williams' unmistakable fanfare blast. Okay, I think we'll get enough for this one. We yeah, got enough? that's good. That's we're good, good. Okay. Two feet. So let's cut this, go ahead and cut that. And this is Sean freezing his nippers off. I know it. <laughs> Black bear occasionally strip the bark of some of these species and use the exposed sapwood as a food source. Some wildlife feeds on the seeds of these trees and use the smaller trees for cover. All right, so again, this is the uh, Star Wars. Uh, so never mind the subtitle from literally the first seconds, which ditches the Pavlonian jolt of the series opening crawl and the John Williams unmistakable fanfare blast. Black bear occasionally strip the bark of some of these species and use the exposed sapwood as a food source. Some wildlife feeds on the seeds of these trees and use smaller trees for cover. Uh, so never mind the subtitle from literally the first seconds, which ditches the Pavlonian jolt of the series opening crawl and the John Williams unmistakable fanfare blast. Black bear occasionally strip the bark of some of these species and use the exposed sapwood as a food source. Some wildlife feeds on the seeds of these trees and use smaller trees for cover. Uh, so never mind the subtitle from literally the first seconds, which ditches the Pavlonian jolt of the series opening crawl and the John Williams unmistakable fanfare blast. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't I can't agree. wait to see it. Yeah, it, I mean, it's worth seeing. Oh Indeed. yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Black bear occasionally strip the bark of some of these species and use the exposed sapwood as a food source. Some wildlife feeds on the seeds of these trees and use smaller trees for cover. So director Gareth Edwards' standalone spin-off prequel has a rhythm and tone all its own. Black bear occasionally strip the bark of some of these species and use the exposed sapwood as a food source. Some wildlife feeds on the seeds of these trees and use smaller trees for cover. So director Gareth Edwards' standalone spin-off prequel has a rhythm and tone all its own. Okay, let's start that again. Black bear occasionally strip the bark of some of these species and use the exposed sapwood as a food source. Some wildlife feeds on the seeds of these trees and use smaller trees for cover. So director Gareth Edwards' standalone spin-off prequel has a rhythm and tone all its own. Super. Yeah. So you chose to read a different passage. That's I okay. did. That's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Sweet. All right. Oh. So You're first. To read. I'm first. I messed up the last, but I read something different, but I'm going to read that again so it's, it's, it's consistent. That works. I'm just going to read the same thing and bore, okay. bore our audience to death. Black bear occasionally strip the bark of some of these species and use the exposed sapwood as a food source. Some wildlife feeds in the seeds of these trees and use smaller trees for cover. Director Gareth Edwards' standalone spin-off prequel has a rhythm and tone all its own. The settings are murky rather than majestic. Black bear occasionally strip the bark of some of these species and use the exposed sapwood as a food source. Some wildlife feeds in the seeds of these trees and use smaller trees for cover. Director Gareth Edwards' standalone spin-off prequel has a rhythm and tone all its own. The settings are murky rather than majestic. Black bear occasionally strip the bark of some of these species and use the exposed sapwood as a food source. Some wildlife feeds in the seeds of these trees and use smaller trees for cover. Director Gareth Edwards' standalone spin-off prequel has a rhythm and tone all its own. The settings are murky rather than majestic. Okay. Yeah, what we should do next is just go have some lunch and record while we're sitting having lunch, just to kind of a more normal... Okay. Why not, right? Yeah, I love sure, it. why not. Okay. When you come to Ashland, you gotta go to Mix and look what assets. What other must have loft, loft, incredible mountain. You didn't know that place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great food. Where else do you have to eat at when you're in Ashland? Uh, brick Room. Mm. Can I go to the Brick Room? Brick Room's good. Yep. Um, just hop around in the plaza. Like a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, sesame. I love I love sesame. Uh, peerless? Peerless. Peerless is a good restaurant. That's pretty high end. That's pretty poshy. Um, a lot of good places here. Cool place. Mm. Cucina Biazzi. Mm. Mm. Good. Uh, Very good. good. No. 
And we had a discussion about the best coffee in town, so you're a fan of Noble. I like Noble too, I really mm -hmm. do. Um, Stumptown, that's what we're drinking right now. No, sometimes not from Ashland, sometimes Portland. But locally, we have two incredible coffee roasters here. Noble Coffee and Case, Case both yeah. local. Those two took number two and number three in the state for best coffee, Stumptown taking number one, which I know a lot of people do agree this is the best. For me personally, I prefer Stumptown, uh, prefer uh, Noble and Case. Yeah. And I like, I like Noble beans to roast, uh, to brew at home, but I like going into Case better and drinking coffee in Case okay. better. All right. Donna, do you, how do you brew it? Do you have a press pod or do you do like a, the coffee maker? Do an espresso, usually, oh, okay. yeah, full shot and either do a cappuccino or do an Americano from an gotcha. espresso shot. Gotcha. I do the, uh, do the press pod at the house, so. The, the French press? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. All right, well this was a fun test. Thank you so much for uh, dragging me mm. along with this. Thank you for helping. And uh, I learned about the daguerreotypes and the mm. daguerreotypes. Shutter speeds. It's okay. You don't have to. <laughs> okay. Good. okay. There's no test after. Oh, I think it, I think I just may have injured <laughs> something. <Yeah. laughs> so there you have it. What do you think? There are some obvious and some not so obvious results here. I want to know what you guys think. Now I've already made my decision, but I want to know what you think. The decision that I made was for me because I had I had to send these mics back, so I sent all but one of them. I kept one because I wanted a new mic. But the rest of them went back. And I really want to know what you guys think are the best and the worst. And you know what? Frankly, tell me what I did wrong because this is as scientific as I could kind of put it together, but it may have not been perfect. I know, you know, I'm just a guy with a camera. So try to put something together that would be interesting, useful, as real world as possible while still being as scientific as possible, if that makes any sense. Whatever. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you are able to make a decision. And again, if you do decide to buy any of these microphones, please do use the links in the description here. That way it goes back to B&H. They know that I've done something with the mics that they loaned me so that I could do these tests and they will continue this fabulous relationship. Right on, guys. Thanks a lot for watching. Take care. See you next time. <laughs>